Well, thanks for joining us for today's webinar on developing and using alumni and patient attachment scores. This is hosted by APRA Great Plains, and uh, thanks for your support. And uh, we've got a group of people from like all over the place in, so I'm excited to uh, be talking with you today. I'm Doug Cogswell. I'm, I lead a company called Advisor Solutions, and we do a bunch of analytics work uh, in a variety of markets, but a, a lot of it's in fundraising and healthcare and higher education and not-for-profits. And we're going to, um, this is sort of a broad topic, but we're going to talk about what is an attachment score or a patient potential score from the healthcare side. How do you get one? Which variables matter most? How do you calculate the weights for those variables? I, I know talking with a number of you uh, created manual weights, but we can use predictive modeling to get probably more accurate weights. And we're going to talk about how do you use these things to find the most attractive prospects and to set more accurate solicitation targets. Uh, there's a bunch of other uses as well, but we're going to drill in on those two. So first, what's an attachment score? The concept is, um, this is just language I, I pulled from uh, several sources, but the idea is to, to use data to figure out how close a constituent may feel towards your organization. So if someone attends events, sits on a board, gives gifts, clicks on a newsletter link, sets up a updates a contact, they're more engaged. On the patient side, it's there's different experiences in the hospital that could cause that same thing. You're trying to figure out how they close they feel to your provider. And certain departments, certain areas, certain providers, certain intensity of interactions make a big difference. And that's what this is all about. And something like, uh, this is something that every fundraising team can do and should do. And it should be set up so that the scores update every day. I know there's consultants who will take your data and score it and give these kinds of things back. But this is unlike capacity, which doesn't change that often. Attachment or patient potential is changing all the time. So you want this so they update. Um, for example, on alumni uh, attachment, uh, maybe somebody has been disengaged, but last week and they came to a reunion and made a gift, well, they should jump up on a Monday morning. They should be handled differently because now they're much more engaged. They're showing a, a disattachment that they weren't before. Then um, knowing how your constituents feel towards your organization is time and again one of the most important factors in determining whether or not they will step up uh, their giving or participation. Uh, some use cases on major giving used to find and assign new prospects. We're going to go through an example of this. Target activities for key prospects to increase attachment. So one of the things, if you get a list of people, uh, if this is done right, you can see that you know this group um, has been coming to reunions, um, they've been making gifts, but boy, they have not been to an alumni event or been on an alumni committee. And the next cultivation step, the data would say to get them more attached or engaged would be uh, to get them on uh, that right committee or get them to one of these events. Solicitation levels, we're going to go through an example here where you can use this with capacity to create an expected ask value. And we can examine under ask and over ask situations because these usually leave money on the table. Uh, these may be tough to get closed. And you can also forecast forward revenue, build campaign pyramids out of this as well. This is capacity and, and attachment over and over again are the two key factors in determining the value of your potential pool of prospects. Annual giving, you want to identify the prospects most likely to respond on different messages for differing segments. We actually have a webinar tomorrow with Wealth Engine on this topic, and we're going to examine some cases where um, the people from the classes in the 70s uh, who have capacity and are engaged are giving exactly the same as everybody else, and that's wrong. They should be uh, asked at a much higher level, and there's a bunch of ways to differentiate the messages and create different ask levels for all of that. So there's more and more happening in this space with both wealth capacity and also attachment. Event attendance, we work with some of the alumni clubs, we work with some of the healthcare providers on how to target the people who might be most likely to respond to an invitation. You wanna balance the right people and the right message. So drilling in um, an attachment scoring model, uh, one of the goals is to have something that's scientific and statistical and accurate versus subjective because you know early on your teams can sit around if, you, if it's a smaller list you can know the people uh, but that's not so reliable and consistent and we want to have this normalized against the base so it's clearly differentiating the factors that are likely to influence somebody to step up and give more. So when you do these things, uh, I'm going to sort of drill through different layers here. Uh, the math creates a score, and it starts uh, you know, a set of known observations, uh, like have you been to events, have, have you um, 
made a gift, yeah, all of that stuff. It goes into a model uh, that weights things with math, logs, squares, sums, uh, linear, all of that stuff. And it ends up with a score. And typically there's a, it starts low, there's a peak. Uh, and usually the scores run from zero to one. It can be you know, zero to 100, whatever. But we typically want to see a range of zero to one. Let's say that's what we're using here. There's a peak at the bottom and then it falls off and there's a tail that runs over to the right. If you do this with prospects versus just everybody, uh, the score is going to kind of, you know, they're generally going to be more engaged, more attached. Uh, the score, the peak is probably a little to the right. You know, instead of down around 0.1, it may be up around 0.15 or 0.2. It's still got the same tail that runs out. And so there's a small group of people who are really engaged and a much larger group that are less so. You know, we find, I'm going to hit this several times, that one of the tricks of using these things is not to throw the scores out because people will debate whether, hey, I've got somebody who's a 0.22 and somebody else who's a 0.26. Why are they different? That's not the point. We would totally recommend binning them into buckets, um, like owners, highly engaged, uh, engaged, detached, or disconnected, because then you can have a discussion about the highly engaged and get off of the, is this, is this person really a 0.2 versus a, you know, a 0.28 or something? Um, but yeah, at some point, you actually do want the scores, you want the factors behind it, but leveling this so it's easy to get a handle on, then you can drill down into detail really helps, and you'll see that as we get through this. And generally, this owner thing, you know, it's going to, there's this wide tail. So uh, you know, these are actually typical boundary points when you look at a score of how we would recommend splitting it. So the definitions, um, we've paraphrased from one of our clients, but it's useful for a team using this to get out of the stats stuff and just help it to be understandable. So an owner across multiple affinity subcategories, they identify as our strongest advocates, benefactors, club members, volunteer leaders, event attendees. They remain connected in a variety of ways, vested in our mission, and show a strong inclination, ongoing support, and so forth. In healthcare, this is going to be people who themselves or a family member have had an experience in, in the hospital, uh, if we're on the patient side, uh, that is uh, reinforcing. Uh, the outcome may vary, but it's been something where they've connected with the providers. Uh, they've been handled well. Uh, there's certain areas that are more intense and create uh, outcomes or benefits that are really respected. And we'll get into some of this, but the area matters. Uh, often we see on the healthcare side, like some of the areas like dermatology that may not be the biggest first focus stepping way up because you've got people coming in with the idea of I'm going to be better when I when I exit. And they are, so they feel really good about the experience. So that's just an example of there's a set of factors underneath this that cause these things to happen. Highly engaged across multiple of these individuals engaged consistently, both the norm provides so, so forth and so forth. Down at the bottom, uh, disconnected across multiple of these subcategories, uh, these individuals currently have very limited or no participation. So getting this into words uh, really helps because it brings it alive and makes it makes it more human. So how do you get an attachment score? We talked about basically what they are. Now where do they come from? Well, in higher ed, um, we'll hit healthcare in a minute. There's a set of things that generally weigh more than others. Um, typically, participating on a volunteer committee with other alumni really, really creates a deeper uh, attachment. Uh, attending reunions. Now, this depends on the school. Um, we've done work with a lot of institutions, but in this case, two elite private schools. In one case, reunions were right at the top of the list. In another case, they were way down the list. And the issue was the reunion programs at the two, two schools are very different. Um, and the same thing with volunteer positions. I mean, some volunteer positions might create a lot of connection and, and affinity. Others might not. Uh, so when we get to the next level, how many of these things you look at, you actually might want to split some of these apart into sub-pieces. Giving history always matters, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Events attended matters. Now, it may matter which events they are. Uh, so if events attendance actually was was strong, uh, and you might want to then look at some of the events that may have strong positive influence, some might have like even a negative influence, some might be more neutral. So you might want to split some of these apart depending on the data you have, and we'll get to more of this in a minute. Whether uh, a child was admitted or, de or denied matters a lot. Are they clicking on your newsletter is an opt-in expression of interest. Um, the more the better. And by the way, you can also figure out interest areas from this, which is not this topic, but another topic. So we strongly recommend at least gathering the data and, and looking at it and using it. Whether they played sports and activities, these for young, 
young alums may come up the list, but for older alums are going to fall down the list. So one message here I'm going to say is the attachment model, um, you can do it across all alums. We're going to hit healthcare in a minute. Across all alums, uh, but a refinement would be to take like younger alums versus older alums who are going to have different things that are causing them to have this attachment. Uh, how far they live, uh, this has some influence because they can get back more often if they're nearby. Um, and there's other stuff like it, 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 this comes up all the time. And what's not on this list is actually uh, social media like Facebook likes and all this. We hear this a lot. We hear this a lot. Uh, we got to get like LinkedIn and Facebook link likes and stuff. That can be helpful, but we've never seen it beat one of these in a model we've run. So yeah, it'd be great, uh, but like let's make sure we get this stuff first. Switching to the patient side or the healthcare side. Uh, this obviously varies a lot, uh, but conceptually what comes up at the top, most, er re most recent area of visit is always strong. And, and depends on the provider which area is going to come up high versus, and some of them are positive, some may be negative, but typically we see, um, you know, it's mentioned dermatology, often a surprise because people aren't expecting it, but you understand what happens in there, it does make sense. But this is clearly uh, provider um, specific, and I'd say general models, uh, uh, which areas have the most influence would be hard to, hard to work with. Age, um, Typically, this age group almost always comes up stronger than the others. Number of visits overall, and we generally will like. So you actually want to have here, people ask what period of time. Um, generally, you want two to five years of encounters data because it takes a while to cultivate. In the peak time between the last visit and making a significant donation is generally one and a half to three and a half years is from our data we're seeing. So. Um, this number, um, and it's up to 49, obviously that would be tough in a year, but over a multi-year period, that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, gender, uh, most recent facility visited. So if, if you have multiple locations, the facilities do have different cultures, uh, different behavioral patterns, and when this comes up in a model, underneath this, you'd actually have the names of which ones. It drives discussion. Uh, and usually uh, when we're doing modeling and we're having discussion, the team ought to be able to describe why this facility has the stronger um, patient potential than another one. Um, and usually there's reasons. And then actually you might want to suggest that maybe the ones that are lower, in some cases even negative, uh, what can we do to change that? Time between the first and last visit, the most recent CPT group, other patients related to the person who have been in the provider, distance from the hospital. This is actually interesting. So. This thing means plus, and it's a log relationship. So what this means is uh, as you get a bit away, uh, it goes up pretty quickly, and then as you get further and further away, it dampens. So if you drew a curve, it would be a you know curve that like kind of looked like this. It started and then went up steeply, then it flattened out, which typically means like if you're coming from like 100 or more miles away, it, it's significant. Uh, by the time you're 500 miles or 3,000 miles, it doesn't matter a whole lot because you're still coming in. But this... So obviously has an impact because it's people saying they're skipping over local providers to come to yours. Number of distinct areas visited, uh, last visit in the last six months. So these are typical metrics that would go into a model. We're going to, in a minute, look at how you would get the weights and, and whether how do you know it's a plus log or a, you know, a plus, one's plus, one's minus, and so forth. But out of patient encounter data, um, it, it varies a little bit whether it's Epic or Cerner or McKesson, what the system is and what the legal uh, restrictions are on the provider letting the foundation side use the data. But we're almost always getting uh, the patient encounter data sufficient to create, to bin these metrics out of it. So in our world, you know, we grab the patient encounter data, we grab on the other one the alumni data, event participation, giving all this stuff. And once we load it, we usually load it daily. We create all these metrics or calculate these metrics, which then go into a model, which we'll see in a minute, which creates the weights, which then creates the scores, which then creates the, you know, high expected, uh, you know, medium disconnected detached buckets. So how much is enough? This comes up all the time. Um, some of our clients, you know, in these attachment models use five factors. Uh, we had one that was trying to use 190 factors, and, and I would say a couple things. I mean, typically, uh, use what you have, and 8 to 15 factors is good. Uh, 
five factors is probably a little thin. You're trying to get enough factors to describe why some people have a behavior. And in this case, the behavior we're looking at is somebody's got a capacity and they're giving at or above that capacity. What differentiates that from everybody else who doesn't have the behavior? So you've got, we call it a target, and maybe the target is people with a capacity rating of 50,000 or more, and maybe the uh, the um, that the base would be the the people with 50,000 or more of capacity. And then what you're trying to differentiate is the people, the target who actually gave 50,000 or more from the rest. And these factors help untangle that. And you need enough factors to you know, explain the difference. But when you get to 190 factors, one of the things you need in statistics is enough members in each of the factors. And you generally need at least 25, preferably you know, 75, 100 or more. You just generally don't have the data distribution to fill out these factors. And also, the factors may overlap. So this would create an overfitting situation or an inaccurate model. So, you know, some, and there's consultants out there who will say, let's build this really rich model with all these factors. You've got to really watch it because there's a balance point. You know, generally, 8 to 15 factors is, is good for these kinds of models. You start going much over that, uh, you get overfitting. You start going under that, you don't have enough to differentiate. So this is a, an important, ta ta um, important topic. And also, most of you have enough data to do this. Uh, you saw what some of the factors look like previously. Um, and we see people going crazy trying to acquire new data versus you know, adequately collecting what they've got. And certainly on the patient side, the patient encounter systems generates a ton of data that's relevant for this. On the, uh, the fundraising side, um, for both healthcare and also higher education, as long as you're capturing event attendance, uh, giving history, you know, reunion attendance on the, on the, health, on the higher ed side, and um, ideally getting newsletter click-throughs, that's the kind of data you want. Um, and it's available and, you know, using that is before you go out and try to acquire like Facebook likes and all that other stuff that generally rates far lower than the stuff that you actually have access to. We also have a theory, something's better than nothing. And, you know, this is the kind of stuff you should get going on and, and run with. So here's a, just an example of how you get you know, five factors versus 190 factors. So maybe one of the factors is numbers of volunteer positions in the last 10 years. That could be expanded, number of class agents in one to five years numbers, the class agents five to 10 years back, the reunion chair, all this stuff. I would say, you know, there's a balance here, and you've got to have enough members in each of these buckets to make it useful. If I ran a model and I saw um, numbers of volunteer positions in the last 10 years jump to the top of the list, and maybe if it has like 50% of the influence, the model will give you outputs like that, I'd say I might now want to explore these volunteer positions and see if they're all equal because it's a big influence. And maybe then I'd want to like run the model against the volunteer participation table and see which ones come up high, just run it on that by itself. Some of these things, like maybe the class A agent comes up high, the reunion chair, maybe the high school interviewing has actually a negative or a low, it'll, it'll spread the actual positions by their influence. Then you might want to bin these into like high influence groups, medium influence groups, and maybe negative influence groups and have numbers of volunteer positions in the last 10 years in the high influence, another one in the medium. But I wouldn't do that unless this thing on its own came out high. And I certainly wouldn't like get to this level of detail across all of these things because it's, it's, you just don't have the data distribution to handle it. Uh, I could talk more on that offline, but that's sort of one of the keys to this. And to take these two pages where people go astray is either trying to run these things with like just not enough factors. And, and I guarantee you, you have data that can create them. Or you try to go crazy with this 190 factor model. So um, punching along here. Um, the next thing on building these models is not all entity types uh, can have the same behavior. And it's really important when you build a model that the people in the population have the potential to have the same behavior. So for example, if you look at, at higher education, undergraduate alumni, alumni from graduate alumni have different experiences. The undergraduates generally play, they can play sports, they can have student activities, uh, they're going to be in fraternities. The graduates probably aren't doing all of that, and parents are going to be different yet, uh, and so forth. So 
when you have this situation where you can't all have the same experience, you would want to build separate models, undergraduate alumni, graduate alumni, maybe it's graduate alumni in the business school versus the medical school because they have different experiences yet and so forth. So just going to be careful about this is, is my last point on kind of conceptually how these models can go uh, strong or, or not so strong. You've got data, um, you aren't collecting it like events attendance um, start. Uh, if the data is skewed, like you're collecting event attendance from events in Boston and New York, but not, you know, Minneapolis and uh, Cedar Rapids, um, just that would be a skewed data set. So you would probably not want to use that until you started getting it. And, you know, attachment is, is almost all internal data, I think is the point there. So where is the data? It's the mo these models run against the entity table usually has some of the information, but there's a bunch of other stuff, and this is higher ed again. Um, you could do the same thing for fundraising where it would be the different uh, outpatient, inpatient, and so forth. But we're calculating, like these numbers of volunteer positions in the last 10 years is something that's calculated out of the volunteering table and put in the entity table as a field. The same thing, the numbers of years they've given out of the last five, the last six to 10, those are all factors that could be calculated out of the giving table and put in the entity table. Um, so when a model gets built, this could either be done in the database, uh, it can be done in apps like ours where we just load these tables and they're all calculated, but uh, it's, in our world, what we do is we implement this so that every time we load these tables, which is usually daily, all these factors get recalculated and the model gets rerun. But that's where they come from. Uh, when you build a predictive model, there's this concept of a target. We talked about this a couple minutes ago. Um, let's say we want to target large donors who actually gave $50,000 and see how they, what makes them different from the others who had the capacity to give $50,000 but didn't. All these explanatory factors uh, relevant, reflect attachment uh, you want to use. And the model figures out the weights and builds a score. So a modeling panel, uh, we call it attachment scores. It's like somebody didn't spell it quite right. Uh, you model the entity table. Uh, in this case, it's a set membership model, which is called a classification model. You just click target selected. It, it then will take the target, the people who have given, compare it to everybody else, all of those who have the capacity to give. And then um, there's a set of factors that have been created, which you check off, and then it runs. On the healthcare side, uh, it'd be the comparable thing, uh, although you probably don't have as often as many donors, you may not have capacity rated everybody. So in some cases, we'll take you know everybody who has had a patient experience has given over 500 bucks or something. So the target might be, you know, the people who've given 500 bucks. The base could be everybody who has been to the provider. We just need to see the distributions, and you work with that. And then the factors would be the things we saw in the chart a few pages earlier, uh, you know, area, number of visits over a period of time, all of that stuff. And then the model crunches, it comes up with a descriptive um, view of key influences. And let's say in this case, it's the numbers of years they've made a gift in the last you know, six to 10, which would be a number ranging from zero to five. Um, they gave off the year six to 10 going back, um, be a five. If they gave a number, it would be a zero. Uh, the higher the number, um, the more the influence is positive and it explains the 40% of this population. Numbers of committees they've participated in the last uh, five years is 30%. Numbers of reunions is like 12%. Numbers of years that they've made gifts in the last five, which complements this is, is 8%. I assume this, these things probably relate because if they've been giving consistently in the past, they're probably also giving consistently in the future. So these relate to each other. Numbers of student activities, um, this wanes as people get older, uh, for young lungs this would be higher, so it tells you what matters. And then it creates a scoring algorithm and a score that ranges from you know, zero to one, which is where we started, which you then want to have been. So what do you do with them? Well, we're gonna look first at using these things to find new prospects. So here's an example um, where we have high capacity um, prospects. These people are rated a lot. Um, so this is 50 million or more capacity, you know, 10 to 50 million, uh, 500,000 to a million, and down, you know, 25 to 50,000. We've taken off the unrated. Uh, we have then these attachment scores, which are owners, highly engaged, engaged, detached, disconnected, which we talked where they came from. On the healthcare side, the comparable would be, so we're doing work 
where maybe there's a, a hundred thousand uh, patients in a, in, a, in a period of time. We may not want to capacity screen them. Uh, we can create patient scores on all of them that would look like this. So maybe for that group, we want to grab the ones with the higher patients potential scores who live in wealthy zip codes or in the you know top 500 wealthy zip codes. So there's public domain capacity information that could be brought in here. So you could take this population of 100,000 and cut it by the people who appear to have wealth based on some public proxy and who have the right experiences in the hospital to look like the people who have given. And then maybe it's 10,000, then you take those off, get them wealth screen, bring them into the advancement system and start you know, using those as your prime prospects because they're more likely than everybody else. And you've got limited resources. You can't focus on 100,000, but 10,000 is a manageable number. And you start then moving them through this, uh, uh, this more uh, advancement attachment where you're looking at event participation, giving and all that and trying to cultivate. Boy, that was a whirlwind. So now I'm gonna go through an example. Um, I'm going to take this and let's say I want to grab, so I'm going to bring this up live. And my question is, do I have any high capacity, highly engaged people who aren't staffed? And uh, I'm going to Florida. So let's see, are the ones who are also in Florida, I'm going to figure out what the right cultivation points are because I want to have a dinner with them. So that would be a use case for this. We're going to come back in a minute and look at using it to calculate expected values, expected ask values and all of that. But uh, I've just opened this up live. So this would have loaded data from last night. It brings it up and we call it a project. It's a, it's a multi-page, hide this text thing. Um, it's got multiple pages that are about this set of roughly 55,000 prospects who have varying capacity ratings, uh, looks like, um, 166 are rated really high, 50 million or more. It looks like 19,000 or so are rated lower. Some of them are you know, engaged at different levels. Uh, 1,500 are owners, some are disconnected. And I wanna see on this group, let's say high capacity and, and highly engaged or attached, we mean, let's take all the ones that are 500,000 or up capacity. And again, this could be done by wealthy zip codes, public domain information, there's a variety of ways to get capacity. Let's, we got this right now. We got that group. It's 6,306 people. Here's a list of who they are. So we also want to figure out the ones who are highly engaged, uh, engaged owners of this group over here. So that intersection is uh, 2,578 people. So the next question is, are they staff? I just switched to the next page, the staffing page. And I see that uh, it looks like 502 of that group aren't staffed right now. The other 2,076 are. Of the ones who are, Megan's got a lot of them. She's got 169. Uh, our recommended pool sizes are sort of 75 to 125 of this kind of thing. So she's got a lot. And there's a group that's got the right amount. I, Dan Law here has got 91 of them. We're colored by uh, the capacity. So there's dark red are the really the 50 million uh, plus people, this is the next group. So he's got the best of the breed here. We ought to make sure he's good. Um, these people may have other people in the pool other than this top end, but we'll get a sense here. I want to grab this no category. So I'm going to select it on the pie, uh, drop to my 502. Uh, let's go to the next page of the map. So I want to see where they live. So this is where the 502 people actually live. Um, some in the Boston area, it looks like I got somebody down here in uh, Milton. Uh, I've got somebody out here in Long Island in uh, Garden City, but I'm going to Florida. So let's grab the group in Florida. Grab that group and get rid of everybody else. And let, let's see who they are. Go back to the first page. Uh, there's 43 people. Um, Agnes Pitcher's given 800,000. Class of 68 parent lives in Naples, Florida. Not staffed. Uh, we mine out of the employment uh, data. Does she have a C level? She we don't know, no employment data. Uh, do they have a C level title? So there's other things we can bring in. Uh, rated one to five million, highly engaged. Okay, got, got my group. I kind of see them. So now somebody asks, I, where are these attachment scores coming from? Because I, I need more details. So I can go to this page on the right, which is going to give the details on these scores. So back to concept, we recommend bidding the scores into buckets that are have easy handles like highly engaged or engaged or owners. 
But then at some point, you actually need the details. I'm going to sort the list by the score. There's somebody here who's got a score of 0 0.2. So this must have been a distribution really towards the left. Um, like the bulk must have been down under um, like probably 0 0.05. So 0 0.2 is really high. They get binned as an owner. Um, these people are all highly engaged. Why is this person an owner? They've been on two committees in the last 10 years. They gave all five of the last five years. They gave four of the five years before that, been to three reunions, played two sports and three student activities. And then as I scan the list, this group is really active giving, really active coming to reunions. I can't change, this has happened in the past. But uh, I'm looking at this list and saying, boy, uh, these people ought to be, you know, let's get them on some committees because if I want to progress them to uh, higher levels of attachment, which is going to create a stronger potential for the gift I'm looking for, uh, let's do that. And maybe the issue here is they haven't been staffed, so nobody's been working with them. So as I'm preparing for my dinner, I'm trying to like think through this stuff. What do I do? I might want to see over here, uh, go back where we are on the map, what's their affiliation? Are there patterns in here? Um, yeah, there's a bunch of people from the 60s. Who are these people? Because I might want to sit them together. Here's a group of like, it uh, looks like uh, 12 people from the classes of the 60s. Well, let's maybe when we arrange tables, we put them together. So I'm using this data to go a little further. Uh, maybe I want to see their giving history. Uh, back up the wrong way. Um, what's been their giving history? So we're coming to this dinner. I'm gonna. I'm interested in Benita Agahajan. She's given 91,000. Um, she's been giving de minimis amounts. It looks like in these years, uh, 2,500. But back in 2008, she made a looks like a $55,000 gift. So she's um, high capacity, highly engaged. Let's look at her giving details. So I've you know, spun down to detail here using that um, total commitment. When was that gift made? Yeah, she made, it looks like in 2008, she made a large gift and she's basically made a couple of gifts a year, lots of them small. But that's going back to the, you know, we use the attachment scores to get a start on this, bring everybody back and get a handle, but then allowed us to drill through a population down to how do you actually best cultivate this group that, uh, that we're having this dinner with in South Florida um, and get them more in the game. So that's one example. Another example is using attachment scores to calculate expected values for each prospect. So there's going to be a little bit of math here, and then we'll go into use cases. Because this gets into campaign um, funnels. It gets into major, major gift uh, management. And this is pretty much comparable on both the healthcare and the higher ed side. The same concept applies. So we're going to define ask as the dollar value of issued proposals. What's been solicited? Expected value uh, is a calculation based on capacity rating times attachment minus, minus giving for the last several years. We put plus or minus in here. This is trying to get an assessment of how much is the prospect worth. And there's two use cases. Is the ask in line with the pr prospect's capacity? Um, for example, if you're asking a million dollars, but the person has an expected value of $10 million, that you want that to be a discussion because you might get the, the one million, but you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Or if the person has you know expected value of 50,000 and you're asking 500,000, uh, you may never get it. And maybe the right starting gift because that person is not engaged would be 50,000 or even 20,000. So these two work hand in hand. The next concept is current year expected pool value. So if I have a group of prospects, the question would be how much is this pool worth this year? And out of that, I've got as the officer, the field officer, make the right decisions on who to actually solicit this year versus next year. But over, say, a seven-year period, I should be able to get my expected total value out of this pool. It's just not going to come every year. So this lets me do pool comparison. So there's two separate concepts here. Let's look at expected value first. So say I'm uh, a prospect manager named John Smith, and I've got here 10 prospects, Jim Major, Sue Johnson, here they are. I've asked, I've got three asks out. I've got a million dollar ask to Jim Major, $100,000 to Sue Johnson, and 50,000 to Mary Morgan, totaling 1,150,000. And these prospects all have ratings, and ratings come in different forms. Uh, sometimes they're A1, A3, sometimes it could be numbers. So let's see what we do with this. The first thing we want to put in is uh, 
you need to put a capacity number. So usually A1 has a range. So let's say it's 10 million plus. A3 is maybe 1 to 10. Sometimes the wealth scores come like this. And, you know, if it's 10 million plus, you want to go over it like 14 million is about right. If it's 1 to 10, you want to go to a third up into the range. So 3 million, these are distributions. So that's generally the rule. Um, you want to go a third in the range. So 500 to a million would be 650. You know, this would be 200. So that's these numbers. So yeah, we basically you want to take the ratings, create a range, and create a number for what the capacity should be. And generally, these capacities are the amount the person could give over some period of time. And often there's a liquidity factor. Sometimes there's so not. If there's a liquidity factor, you can divide by that. If there's not, we generally would take seven years for how this might pay out. Then there's the affinity or attachment scores, which we've been talking about. They run from low 0 0.09, uh, 0 0.05 up to high 0.33. So you multiply them together. 14 million times 0.33 is 4,620,000. 4, high capacity, high uh, attachment or affinity, high expected value. 6 million, uh, 0.28 high. Uh, here's uh, 14 million again, but 0.19 is so lower. So these numbers are what you would expect this person to give uh, based on how engaged they are with you and what their capacity is. And when if you do this work, it's important to validate this against uh, history because sometimes these scores here could be systematically off and they all need to be dropped by 20% or 30% or it may be increased. So you, know, you can't just take this math at face value. You have to do some testing to say if I go back to my maybe my last five year major donors, did what they actually give over that period match this? And, and, and no, it's not going to match each one, but but in total, am I systematically off or am I generally okay? And if I'm systematically off, under or, or over, I want to adjust how I apply these scores. But let's say this works. So now I have the situation where I'm the manager, and I'm going to ask some questions. Um, and note, this usually drives a pretty good discussion. Is $1 million ask good or bad? Uh, the $1 million ask that you major would drive a discussion. If this guy has an expected value of $4.6 million. This looks low. Um, we want to know why. I mean, it could be the capacity is off or the person is liquid or there's the factors in the attachment just aren't right. I, that's fine. But you at least want to have the discussion. And we have seen in our clients cases where there's a lot of excitement about a $1 million um, ask pending close. And we would flag, well, this looks like a $12 million expected value. And why are we happy about this? This person's already given $5 million. Why couldn't we create some naming um, scheme for this person to give at what looks like their expected value? So I, when this works, you don't want to settle for the million dollars. You want to have the discussion. This might be fine, but maybe we're leaving money on the table. Another one would be, um, here I'm asking you know, $50,000 to Morgan, Mary Morgan. Looks like her expected value is only nineteen five. And is this okay? I mean, might we be better off getting her on board with a $20,000 gift now and then building to this over time? Maybe she's not ready. It goes both ways. Um, so this comparison drives discussions at the prospect level, which could be really rich and helpful. And we've seen clients increase the numbers uh, of million dollar donors and, and push some of these things up because they've had these discussions. But they need to be discussions. It's not hard and fast. Now let's look at this current year expected value. So the idea here is, you know, not everybody's going to give this amount every year. They're going to give this over some period of time. Some people will give this year. Some people give next year. Some people give five years out. So the concept here is there's a liquidity factor to this expected value that you divide the expected value to get a current year expected value. And some of the rating um, companies will create a liquidity score, which you can use for this, 20 years, 10 years, two years, one year, uh, 100 years, I don't know, 100 years is probably long. Uh, if you don't have it, generally we've seen in our work, seven years kind of works. You might have to, again, examine this to see when you do this, is this actually working with what reality is? Uh, so maybe it's 10 years or 5 years or 12 years, but it's somewhere in that area. So the concept is you divide, in this case, each of these by 7. So you get a total, which is saying this pool, which the total expected value is almost $10 million, in a given year should yield $1.3 So then what you want to do is compare the $1.3 
3 million with the actual ask amount of 1.1 million. And generally, we like to see a two to three coverage ratio because you're going to close generally 25 to 30 percent of what you ask. And you close this, you're going to get this. Uh, so that's the idea. You, you want to see this number be two to three times the expected value, and that's good. Uh, and again, it's not hard and fast. So let's look at an example here. Um, this, this plays into other major giving metrics, and we've done a bunch of talks on this. But for a major giving team, um, you want to have you know so many prospects, and that needs to be balanced against you know the ability to actually get to them and move them. You want to have so many visits. You want to uh, this content of penetration is if you have a hundred prospects, you should connect with at least eighty percent of them in a year. It's never going to be 100 because some of them will qualify out, uh, and that's fine. They'll always be churned and part of the portfolio. But if this isn't happening, that's probably a discussion. We've done a bunch of talks on how long they stay in a stage. Um, we've got this pool balance uh, and ask coverage. Are we asking enough that we have the right balance across the pool, and uh, are we getting appropriate closes? And what happens is the attachment's key to making sure we got the right uh, pool balance, that we actually have the right kinds of prospects in our pool so we can raise the revenue we're looking for. And this then becomes, our, am I asking at the right level? And these, all these things relate together. So we've had some cases where, you know, looking at times in the stage, but we're not looking at ask coverage. So if, I, I, if I'm measured on moving things along, I'm going to under ask and get them closed real quick. I'll have a high yield. I'll be moving things rapidly, but I'm leaving money on the table. On the other hand, if I'm asking aggressively, I may slow my stage moves down. I may drop my yield, but I actually may bring in more revenue. So uh, in our world, in our way of thinking, doing this is really important uh, to making sure the entire pool is being managed well. And attachment is a key part of figuring uh, this out. So a graphical way of looking at this is here's a bunch of field officers. And uh, they're in different groups. So this is the leadership giving group. This is the VP of development group, the law group, the mayor group. And again, on the healthcare side, you can this could be different uh, different areas of, of research. It could be oncology, it could be cardiology. You, know, you can figure that out. But in this case, the size, Nancy Barrios is big because she's got a lot of solicitations out on the street. And it's called by the coverage ratio, which is the sum of her solicitations compared to the current year expected value of her pool. And she's green because she's up around uh, like three, which is she's got a good coverage ratio. Francesca Peachtree has a smaller pool, but she's actually asking really aggressively. So for her prospects, they must be lower capacity or lower attachment. She's actually really aggressively asking. Now, I want to make sure her pool's also moving through stages, and she's getting things closed, but at least looking at the pool, that's great. John Brown, I'm going to have a, a discussion with because he's got a lot on the street, um, but it looks like he's under asking compared to the capacity and the attachment of his pool. His, um, the sum of his solicitations divided by the current year expected value is down around you know, 0.8, which is the color here. That's not good. Now, there's a bunch of reasons that could be, but I also, I, I could tell you that if we drilled in on John Brown, uh, we would see that he's moving things through the stages really quickly and has a really high close rate. Well, that's a, another set of clues that he may be under asking and we should have a discussion with him. Hey, you're doing great on these things, but let's bring the ask levels up. So that's how these things apply. And then we go a little further, you know, why are there poor coverage ratios? Um, maybe not asking enough, maybe under asking maybe not getting the top rated prospects. The pool's too big. Um, we see this with, uh, with uh, maybe uh, VPs and senior people on the teams where they get this huge pool of everybody and the, we've got a few people who are really high capacity who they're just hard to get to because they've got too many people and I'm closing all these other people. It could be that the rating was wrong, the attachment score was calculated. So there's a bunch of reasons why those, you know, those situations with John Brown and Francesca on the, following the slide are there, but uh, if it drives the right discussion, it's pretty awesome because the goal is here to get the most revenue in the most efficient manner, and those set of things are all contributing to it, and this ability to create effective attachment scores or patient potential scores are really important. So uh, that was a whirlwind. Uh, this has been recorded. Uh, the PDF is available. Um, when we push out 
the messaging with the recording. We also have a, a series of other related webinars on the field officer metrics and, and capacity uh, um, for campaigns and these pyramids and how you can use these to create that. But you know, conceptually, if you're calculated an expected ask for each entity or each prospect, you can sum them uh, by by different areas. Like if their um, patient experience was in oncology, and you sum them all, you have a pool potential for oncology for a campaign. Um, and you could compare that with what I have for the patients out of uh, maybe uh, orthopedics, and you'd see what the potential is there. And it would be rated by the connection uh, capacity or, or capability of those two provider areas. Um, so that's that's a related topic uh, here. So I'm going to stop. We have some time for questions. Um, what do we have? There's a question on the healthcare side about um, accessing patient encounter data. Um, I paraphrase it. Uh, the we we work with patient encounter data. It, it's legally allowed in the U.S. Other nations have restrictions on it, but it's legally allowed for fundraising. Uh, there's some uh, elements that have, cannot be there. I think the outcome is not allowed. There's other things that are just not allowed. But um, that data, uh, sort of a reading deeper into the question, normally the provider side is not going to let an analytical app like us touch the Cerner or the McKesson systems or the Epic systems because they're actually running the hospital. So normally what happens is somebody in IT on that side writes an extract script that do drops out daily, sometimes weekly, we prefer daily, extracts from the system with the uh, all the encounters for that day. And then tools like us can append you, so you need the base to start with, but then we can append the daily ads on top of the base and then sweep it in and do the things we've been talking about here. Um, so that's that's pretty routine. And I would say that the legal departments in different medical institutions vary on their uh, propensity to, to make the data available to the foundation of the fundraising side. But you know, we're working with some um, pretty uh, visible top tier clients and, and there's been no issue. We've gotten through all of those and it's it's been game changers on how they work. Um, another healthcare question it revolves, how do you key the data together if you don't have common IDs between the patient encounters and the uh, fundraising data? And, and generally the fundraising data in higher ed, Razor's Edge or Blackboard CRM. And we, we, we are a Blackboard technology partner. We work with their stuff all the time. We're engaged in technology discussions with them and so forth. But um, there, are, uh, provi there are other firms who can key this together. Omatic in particular can key the, on the Razor's Edge side uh, back to the uh, patient data. We also can do that. So we uh, can parse out of uh, on both sides. We create matching keys which involve uh, the last name uh, of the patient or the guarantor um, we have to take key parts out of the address. You have to watch that. You can't parse the, the address by itself because like north could be N or north or whatever, but you, you can grab the major word, the, the postal code, the street address. So we can create compound keys that we're getting 80% matches on. Um, and it's pretty flexible. So you just, we sweep the data and we create the keys. We link the tables together. And actually what that allows, so we just heard from one of our clients, um, they went into one of the field officers was in with one of the providers and let's say it's a cardiology area and the discussion went like i want to look at all of my patients for the last two years who have been to an event and or made a gift who are they so you just basically on the we have those pages you saw in the demo you have a patient a page on the patient side and you sweep over uh, the last two years on a line chart click on the provider's name now you've got all of the patients who have had an encounter over the last two years with this provider, it links back to the Blackboard Razor's Edge or CRM system, or whatever's on that side. And, and then you see, well, out of the, I don't know, 6,000 patients, you know, 30 of them have been to an event, uh, these specific events, and also made a gift. So you just click, click, click like I was doing before. Now I have a list of 30 people at the speed of thought with this provider. He said, hey, these are awesome. And they're all, and maybe, uh, you know, we're in Chicago, maybe 28 live, 28 live in the Chicago area. Let's get them together for an event. 
so it can literally be that quick. And uh, keying the data together is not that hard. Um, and the fact that it's you know updating daily, these these numbers are, and these these potential scores are constantly changing. Um, and, and you know you can quickly see what you got. And it can be used in real case examples like that where you're with the people. Yeah, I, I actually I've got somebody made a point. I, I will be tweeting on this topic uh, and love you uh, love to have you follow me you can see my contact information below um, and we also have a webinar tomorrow uh, with wealth engine on the use of wealth screening and annual giving uh, which we've got a big group coming to um, two of us are partners and you know we're trying to figure out how to get some really good wisdom into that side of the market so if you're interested in tomorrow uh, it the logon would be www.advisor, it's A D V I Z O R webinar.com. Advisor, A D V I Z O R webinar.com is the login for tomorrow's webinar with Wealth Engine, which is uh, using the metrics and, and analytics and uh, these kinds of scores on the annual giving side. Other questions? A bunch of them. If, if we don't get your question live, we will. Uh, follow up with you afterwards. The so question, are there data uh, size limits to what you can handle? Um, there's, there's two, it's that, there's, there's, in reality, yes, but uh, so, but, but conceptually, no, but we, we, we can handle, and in these situations, um, Razor's Edge or BlackBot CRM uh, have fragmented table structures, so we're typically, in those cases, loading in in, in a Lucy and Advanced Banner are similar, 30 to 150 tables. It depends if their warehouses are flattened or not, but we don't have a problem with that. And we can load in patient encounters is typically one, one table, which we're doing some formatting on in front of us. And, you know, we're loading in, uh, I don't know, uh, the upside for us is probably 100 million total rows and 400 fields of all different data types, which in this this space uh, we've never never hit that limit. And it's not a hard limit; it's a it's a machine resource limit. Um, put us on a bigger machine, we could go more. But you know these these data sets um, run well, uh, and we're an in-memory model. We run on Windows desktops. We run on servers. We can be hosted. We can be on-premise. We I was showing a browser. Um, access in my demo runs on iPads, so we can basically run anywhere. We just need something uh, running that can get access to the data, um, either pulling it off the cloud or if it's on-premise, pulling it out of databases, and then we can move it to pretty flexibly wherever you want it to run. And we really don't have a, a size limit uh, in terms of how much data in this space. And you know, the thing we're doing is we're taking this data and we're uh, accessing it from the sources, then we're blending it together and uh, synthesizing it, scoring into these bins, and then pushing it out so people can work with it. Um, and uh, that's sort of the name of the game here, and um, that, that's our world, and that's, that's what we're good at. Uh, another question is, when you, who does this work? That's a really good question. That's a paraphrasing the question again. So we sell software uh, that allows you to get access to all this data and it accesses blood, it synthesizes it and pushes it out. The setting up the models and the metrics across the tables is, is a bit tricky. Uh, typically, our team will do that. We have consultants who do this all the time. Uh, we work with Epic and Cerner and Razor's Edge and Blackbot and Elucian Advance, and we're partners of Elucian Two and Banner. So we're we're good at untangling what the content actually is in the data tables, and we're really good at creating these cross table expressions that go into the models. And then we, we usually set the models up. Um, we're all wizard driven, so somebody who can write Excel macros can write the expressions in us and also do the modeling. And then the models persist in our we create, we call them projects. So once you build this and get all the data links in, you get the metrics calculated, the scores calculated, we save as basically a large Excel workbook. Uh, we call it an advisor project file. But that, that sits somewhere on a file server and then it usually gets kicked off at some point in time to reload data. And when it does that, it re-executes all of the 
all the metrics calculations and re-executes the scores and then all the charts get redrawn and then it comes up interactive uh, the, the next morning for the team. And that whole process, as I said, can be run on-premise, run in the cloud. It depends on what your restrictions on data movement are, uh, preferences, and all of that. But we're a pretty light footprint front end of these systems. Um, but we, we, we deliver solutions. So our delivery is uh, you know, software with metrics that we calculate, and we help you use them. So like the scenarios we went through, I went through today, uh, we would help set up. And if it's on the major giving side with metrics, we help coach the team on how to use them. It's not like, here it is, like, go have fun with it. It's, you know, here it is. And you seem to have some, we run through scenarios. We've, we've even been in reviews with field officers and management, uh, helping them use the software to draw out the discussions. So part of what we do is untangling data, data complexity. Part of what we do is turning it into useful content. And part of what we do is working with the teams so that they can actually use it to make better business decisions. Same thing on the healthcare side. I mean, we've when we do these models on patient potential, um, you saw the factors back a while ago uh, usually come up, but there's a bunch of discussion. Uh, I've sat in rooms, I've seen my team sit in rooms where there's a discussion of why is this, this location getting rated low or why is this area coming up high? And it might be the areas coming up high because the field officers have been soliciting in that area so it's actually not independently creating connections, it's creating connection because the field officers have been in driving it. Well, that, that needs to get adjusted because in, you know, from discussion, we now understand it's not an independent factor, it's driven by the team and it's not a reflection of what the provider's doing. So all of that, it comes out uh, as we work with you and there's other consulting firms that can help with that. I think what we do that's unique is we not only drive the model and the discussion and, and are savvy about those things, but when we're done, there's something that's running. It's recalculating stuff every day and pushing it out to the team so it's not static. It's not a report. It's, it's active and live. When we had, here's another question. When we had predictive analytics demoed at our organization, it seemed the secret sauce of our analytics was finding the optimal transformation of the predictive variables and using some type of maximum likelihood calculation to find the weights. Can you speak to the methodology of finding the right algorithm? Interesting. Um, so there are a bunch of modeling algorithms out there. Uh, we use multivariant regression. We actually our algorithms come from a firm called Rapid Insights. Um, we have those embedded in our app. That's what we run. Uh, there are other algorithms. There's neural network. There's a whole variety of other things. There was just an article on this, though, that most problems in the business world can be solved with multivariant regression algorithms. And we have classification, which is set membership, and standard linear regression, which is forecasting a number. And these all these other algorithms are valuable, but they're usually in other problem spaces where you have um, flows or real time. There's a bunch of other stuff that you would use those for. Um, so I've seen teams also get over focused on what the what the modeling algorithms are, when in reality, multivariant regression can handle most of what you are trying to do here. And this it kind of goes in with the concept of, you know, what's the right number. Number of factors is 190 factors good with some fancy algorithm? I, I'd say no. You'd be better off with you know 14 factors with something your team can work with that's understandable, um, because the complexity of the models and the complexity of the data trades off against the team actually discussing it and understanding and being able to do it on their own. Like that example from a minute ago, of where the provider area was scoring high because the field officers were working in it versus other areas can only come out of discussion with the team because the, the math itself is not going to know that. And empowering, you know, the, the teams to do this themselves and have these discussions is really important. And um, I mean, there clearly are more sophisticated modeling tools than ours. R is very sophisticated. You know, SPSS and SAS are really sophisticated but they require data prep in another system. Uh, they require somebody with more of a statistics, statistics knowledge to execute them and they get away from this theory of people who are Excel savvy can do these on their own and, and work them with the team and have these discussions. So that's our whole philosophy in this and that's what we're trying to empower. 
Uh, there actually are a bunch more questions, but we're also reaching our one o'clock time limit. Um, I would say you've got my contact information up here. Uh, this has been recorded. We are going to push it out within the week. And, and uh, if you're interested in learning more, one, we'd be glad to open up you know, conversations with our various clients in higher ed or healthcare, which is the bulk of this, or in also not-for-profit. We have a wide range of clients in all three areas, and they're all using this kind of capability. And the best way to, you know, I can continue to pontificate, but they can give you real world examples of how this has helped them, empowered them, and, and several of them would say uh, been a game changer in how they do fundraising. So um, I want to thank you for the time and uh, have a great rest of the day. Take care.